exciting edition of uh, Rotary After Hours on this wonderful February 2-22-22, so the day of twos. Uh, I'm not sure who's controlling my slide deck, but whoever it is, can we go to the next slide? All right, uh, we will stand and do the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. So the meeting is being recorded for those who are online and those in person. Uh, we are, uh, we're going to try and run this, uh, I'm going to try and run this from the other side of the country. So we're going to see how it works tonight. Um, do we have any guests or visiting Rotarians tonight? Yes, we have one guest. All right. Yeah. James, take it away. I'm in charge of introducing the one guest. <laughs> I mean, I've already introduced myself once. We have a guest. Her name is Kelly. She's already introduced herself once, and she's going to do it again. Yeah. I'm Kelly. I'm the clerk of court for La Crosse County. And I'm happy to be here. Thanks. Cool. I have a guest. This is Sawyer. It's his first Rotary meeting in person, out of the womb. <laughs> He's happy to be here, even if he cries, I promise. What question should we ask Sawyer then? Uh... <laughs> no, we'll skip it. Okay. Well, excellent. So welcome to our guests. We appreciate it. We're glad you're here. And uh, let's move on to our next slide. Uh, welcome to those joining us vir virtually, including myself. I don't think we have any guests joining us virtually, but it's good to be with everybody. Um, next slide, please. Lisa, are you controlling the camera as it like pans around the room? I am not controlling it. It is going to wherever the sound is. Okay. Well, it's like panning, which is very nice. I get a good view of where everybody is. Uh, so uh, membership update, we have 61 active members. We have two members that are leaving us. Uh, life, you know, was, was busy for Michael. And I think, uh, you know, we've unfortunately, uh, one, of our, one of our members here, Lakshay, is uh, headed back to India here soon. So I believe he's here tonight. And I know there was some, uh, some conversation about a potential happy hour after the meeting. So uh, definitely wish him well. Next slide. Uh, Sula's cultural dinner. So I know Morgan had sent out an email yesterday. Uh, I don't know if anybody from membership is here. I see Phil is here. Does anyone want to speak about Sula's um, and the event coming up on March 6th? Phil does. Morgan is going to. Morgan's going to. Okay. Hi, Morgan. Sorry, it's hard to see people in your distance. Hi, can you see me? Hi. I don't know. Where I can see you. Hello. <laughs> oh, okay. So as Josh mentioned, we'll be doing um, this part, we're kind of gonna do something a little bit different instead of one membership recruitment event, we're kind of do, gonna do a lot of events in March. And the first one will be um, a dinner at Sula's on the 6th. Yep, okay. <laughs> um, the 6th, so we'll start at 5.30. Um, Marissa actually just made a sign up today for it. Um, it'll be $23 for a five course meal. They'll be served family style. Um, We'll get a chat a little bit about Rotary, kind of what we've obviously what our club was done, has done, and then what other kind of international clubs, and then we'll get to learn a little bit about um, Greek culture from Greg, and um, be a good time. There'll be um, drinks won't be included, but there will be a bar that you can uh, cash bar that you can purchase. Um, other than that, yeah, it should be a good time. Um, and he did promise us dancing and breaking plates. So. <laughs> Gonna say if that doesn't sell it enough. <laughs> we encourage to bring guests. Yeah. You bet. I was gonna say invite anyone. Invite family, friends, neighbors, coworkers, randos, whoever you think might be a good, a good fit for the club. I should say randos with good ethical standards and stuff. 
they wouldn't be randos then. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. And if there are any questions, feel free to reach out to myself or anyone on the membership committee. I should see if there's any questions right now, too. Did you say you're sending out a registration link? And actually, I was going to say, is it on Club Runner? I can send, I'll, I was going to say, I'll send one out in the next couple of days. It's also on Facebook. Oh, good question. Um, so actually, we do have to get, because today's the 20, 22nd, um, we'd like to get the numbers over to Greg by the end of this month. So the sooner the better, just so that he can make sure to have enough food and everything like that. Good question. I'm grab that. Yeah, like we said, invite, invite friends. It should be a fun, fun time. Okay. Oh, oh, Thank you, Morgan. Appreciate it. And thanks to the membership committee for uh, for planning out those, uh, those all those different events. So, next slide, please. Um, youth exchange, Lisa or Ashley? Oh, too far, too far. <laughs> okay, so we are committed to hosting a student for the next school year. So we will be finding out who our student is in the next month, what country they are, um, what country they're from, what gender they are, and we don't have any host families yet for our student. So if you want to host, please talk to me. If you know of anyone who would be interested in hosting, please let me know. I can provide more information about what that all entails. But we have to have our host family, our first host family committed within 30 days of finding out who our student is. So there is a little bit of a timeline to finding our first host family, or I don't know, maybe they would take the kid away from us and we wouldn't be able to host then. So it doesn't have to be um, a Rotarian, it can be anybody. So if you know of anyone who would be interested in having a high school kid stay with them, please ask if they would be interested. Um, and again, I'd be happy to talk to anybody about what it all looks like if they want further information. Yes. Is there like a stipend that helps with like There is no compensation to the family. Okay. There can be some tax benefits, but there's nothing that they can, they can't get anything for being a host family. Any other questions? Are there meals during the day? Lunch so, for school or yes, yeah, school lunch is paid for, um, and the students get a stipend, so they get $75 a month to spend on whatever they want. But I mean, there obviously there still are some expenses with having another person live with you for three months. So, whatever the first host family is, wherever whatever district they're in, then the student will continue to go to that district, and we've had. Um, families who have lived in a different district, but because the first host family was in a certain district, then like the, the child just has to be transported to that school the entire time that they're here. So there, it, I mean, we've had Central on Alaska, um, there have been students in Holman, so we're not limited. Um, yeah. Great, thank you. Thank you, Ashley, elections update. Yeah, um, so thank you everybody that nominated people um, in the survey. The emails went out to those that were nominated. So make sure you check your emails, um, get back to either Steph, Brianna, or I by the end of the month. It's March 3rd or 4th. Um, and then after that, we will be working I will be setting up meetings with people that have accepted their nomination to talk further about the position. Um, I don't know if I'm supposed to say this, but secretary elect and director of three years, so no one has accepted them. There's still people we haven't heard from, but if you were nominated for one of those positions, I would say to strongly talk to the secretary. So, any questions? Okay, thank you. Thank you, Ashley. Uh, so Rotary Internet, just as an FYI, Rotary International's 117th anniversary is tomorrow. So uh, if you want to wish Rotary International a happy anniversary, feel free. Uh, a friendly reminder, Shark Tank 2022, if you have questions on projects, uh, let us know. But uh, we're excited for some great pitches again this year. 
Tricon is coming up as well. So for those who are new, uh, we do an annual district Rotary Conference and we do it with two other districts. So the Northern Wisconsin and um, Upper Peninsula of Michigan and then the Eastern side of Wisconsin Rotary Districts. So we do a, a Tricon, which we get better speakers and a larger, uh, larger kind of venue and things like that. So it's a pretty cool thing. Uh, it will be in Elkhart Lake, Wisconsin this year. It'll be April 29th through the 30th. So if you've never gone to a district conference, it can be a really good, uh, really good event and really good way to kind of learn more about Rotary. So uh, I believe there are a couple of people going. I know Bill's going. I believe Marissa's going for at least part of it. So if you have any questions, uh, feel free to reach out to them. Or uh, I believe the, there's additional sign-up information, but they have speakers and workshops and it's all things Rotary. So. And then Caitlin, is Caitlin with us tonight that she could speak about the recruitment video meeting? Yes, Caitlin is here. Oh, um, I guess we are going to look for people who would be interested in setting up like a storyboard um, for our member recruitment video. Um, and if anybody knows local videographers who might be willing to um, assist in shooting the video and editing the video for a total of $1,000. Uh, let me know if you would have any suggestions. Okay, thank you so much, Caitlin, for taking the lead on that. And uh, yeah, it should, be, it should be a cool way to highlight our club. So any questions, please let Caitlin know. And then I think we're ready for the next slide. Mobile meals delivery is coming up. Um, I believe a sign up went out today. So that's always a good time. It's a great way to get out. Uh, I think there was a, a few people signed up, but we need some additional folks in this, this time of year getting out and helping those, especially with snow and bad weather, get their meals is, uh, is important and a great thing. So anything you would add, Caitlin? Okay, sweet. I wish I was in town and able to do it. Next slide. Uh, family night at the Boys and Girls Club. Neil, are you in the house and willing to give us an update on kind of how the event went? Yes. The event went really well. Uh, we had about 13 volunteers, 12 volunteers there. We fed it was probably close to 100 kids. And we had plenty of leftovers, but those leftovers went to the other club where they served adults the next day and kids the next day too as well. We helped them. We did uh, paper airplanes. We helped them with board games, guess who, all that other stuff. So it was a really good time and the kids really appreciated it. They had a great time too as well. Awesome. Thank you, Neil. Next slide. Points for polio. Um, is I know Steph was taking the lead on that. Is there anybody in the room who's involved with the Pines for Polio planning that wants to speak to it? I see somebody standing. <laughs> yeah, I can talk about it. Um, okay, so like it says, it's March 31st, which is a Thursday. So it's at Turtle Stack Brewery. For $20, you get four tastings and then you get a pint. Um, that's what we got right now. So <laughs> invite your friends. It's gonna be good. Awesome. Thank you, Sierra. We appreciate it. Thanks for uh, you know being part of that committee. It's always a great event, so I'm glad we're, we're able to do it again this year as COVID hopefully lightens up. Uh, and there's always money to be raised for polio. Next slide, please. Um, so tonight we have uh, an excellent program on electric vehicles. So if um, I apologize that I'm not there in person, but uh, you know, Jeff, if you're able to, oh, here we go. We're getting the PowerPoint out. Jeff, we'll, uh, we'll introduce you. You're the manager of uh, elect, um, innovation and I think efficient power at Dairyland uh, Power Cooperative. So I will turn it over to you, Jeff. Thank you for, thank you so much for coming tonight. We're excited to hear. I've heard you speak before and I think this will be a really enlightening piece with uh, how electric vehicles continue to grow and evolve and seem to be everywhere these days. So over to you. Thank you. 
Okay, thanks for the introduction. I think I'm in a good place for the owl to see me. I don't know for sure. I no, you are. A lot of people are, you are good. And I'm tall, so You're that's good. going to be a problem if I stood up. So I'm just going to sit here. And then um, waiting for you to, Marissa's going to clear the screen for us here. But just to clarify, my title is uh, uh, Innovation and Efficient Electrification, but the electric power is close. So. Thanks, Jeff. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, it's all right. It's all right. <laughs> Wait for the technical difficulties are resolved yet. We're getting it. Somebody at James table must be chewing really loud because the camera is really focusing in on you guys. <laughs> <laughs> it's Sorry. Actually, it's just, Sorry. It's just uh, I, I, I was going to say, it seems like it's not lean. It's like so. It's amazing how it zooms right in, too. We can see every one of you so clearly. <laughs> there we go. There's there we the go. <laughs> They're working on fixing it in the room. So I know you all can see it, but they're working on the room. All right. So Jeff, how long have you been at Dairyland Power? Gosh, over 30 years. Um, and I did explain to somebody else here tonight, um, when we think of Dairyland Power, you probably always think of the electric generation and transmission side of things, because that's primarily what we do. We generate and transmit electricity. We have distribution cooperatives that distribute it to the final consumers. But my entire career has been on the other side of the meter, if you will, working with consumers on energy efficiency. And then that evolved into the whole uh, electric vehicles uh, area and other things that are still coming. Let's see if I have control of the slides now. I've got them up. I don't, but Marissa can advance them. We can just go that way too. Yeah. Yeah, she's really good at it. She's done it. She got lots of practice earlier in the meeting. So. Yeah, good for you. So. She did good for you. Oh, oops. Did you advance that or did I? Um, now you think I can't? Oh, hey. Look at that. All right. How cool is this? All right. So very good. Um, it's got a delay here. There we go. Probably going to go two now. All right. We'll get there. I got to be patient. That's what I'm learning here. It's not easy for me. Okay. Got it. So um, myths, um, I'm going to do some myths and facts here, or uh, well, hopefully not alternative facts, but myths and facts anyway. Um, electric vehicles are so expensive that only the super rich can afford them. Well, this was partially true. I mean, when the Teslas came out, right, the first ones were $100,000 and uh, had limited range and so forth. There weren't many places to refuel, but things have changed since then. Um, the initial cost is still higher in general for electric vehicles, but the ownership cost is considerably lower. Uh, driving an electric car down the road, uh, the cost per mile for the fuel is less than half of the cost of gasoline, and that was even before the price of gasoline went up. So probably closer to about a third the cost of driving with gasoline now. Maintenance is very, very low. I have a Mustang Mach-E, and my maintenance schedule is, well, I don't even know. I think after 100,000 miles, there may be some maintenance scheduled, but other than that, changing the tires and the basic things that you have to do on any car are the only maintenance things that I expect to have. So um, the price uh, parity, we expect by 2025, and when I say price parity, that means the first cost or the initial cost of the car would be the same as a comparable gas car. And so you'd be able to go buy a car that was electric for about the same price as you could buy a gas car. And at that point, if it's half the cost to operate it, it would be a much more attractive proposition, right? Hopefully by then, by 2025, we have a lot more charging infrastructure out there, so it's not so hard to drive down the road. And the other thing that is a fact is that the used vehicles are often available at really attractive prices because people aren't sure about how long the batteries are gonna last, because we don't have all the you know infrastructure for recharging that we'd like to have. 
the price of the used electric vehicles in the marketplace is often way lower. The exception to that, again, is Tesla, because there's this panache about owning a Tesla, and so uh, those tend to hold their value really well. But the Chevy Bolts of the world and so forth, often available with 10 to 15,000 miles on them, and just a few years old for half the price they were new. So um, if you can get into a, a used electric vehicle, really, really reasonable. So I'm waiting now for the advance to happen. I did push the button. Well, get overzealous and get it again. There we go. Now I did it. So let's see what happens. All right. So the range myth. Uh, electric vehicles are only good for local trips because you just can't drive them very far. Again, partially true. The early vehicles were dismal in their range. So the early Nissan Leaf, for example, um, was only capable of about 70 or 80 miles. Uh, then the, there was, uh, let's see, the Mitsubishi IMEV was another very small car that had a very limited range, about 80 miles or something like that. So it was a city car, basically, right? You couldn't really drive it out of town. We didn't have any charging infrastructure anyway. So those early ones did have a dismal range. My Mach-E has 270 miles of range, which is pretty reasonable. In the wintertime, it's less because I'm heating the car and uh, that energy uses the battery as well because there's no engine to scavenge heat off of. But, um, you know, it's one to where when I bought it, the idea was that I'd be able to drive the entire Dairyman system we cover about 60,000 square miles. It's a huge system. We go all the way from Lake Superior down into Illinois and as far east as um, central Wisconsin to as far west as central Minnesota. Um, so far, I've been able to drive the entire day of the system. Now, caveat in that, a lot of our electric cooperatives have a charger. So when I get there, I have a charger at my destination. That helps, right? I can pick up 40 miles of range. That helps along the way. But more and more, I'm able to find fast chargers along my route too. So that that's uh, getting better and better. <clears throat> and most of the new vehicles that are coming have at least 200 miles of range, many over 300. There are some, uh, let's see, the uh, Rivian truck supposedly is going to come with as much as 400 miles of range. They just do that by putting a massive amount of battery in it. Uh, there's another one, the Lucid Air, which is super aerodynamic and also has a pretty big battery that's getting close to 400 miles of range. So you can get into some cars that have some significant range. Both of those are still relatively expensive. But Go faster. I have to start clicking this in between. What the next topic is. Here we go. No chargers. Okay, we've talked a little bit about this, that there uh, really weren't very many EV charging stations. There still really aren't, in my opinion. For example, in La Crosse, we don't have a fast charger. Uh, there's the Tesla supercharger station. But one fact to know that's an important uh, takeaway from tonight is that the um, <clears throat> supercharger stations only work on Tesla cars. Now there are adapters for Tesla cars to use the other chargers, but there are no adapters for the other cars to use the Tesla chargers. You might say, well, that's probably because there's no way that that can be done. That's not true because in Europe, all the cars that go to Europe have to have the CCS charging standard on them. So the Teslas that go to Europe have the CCS charging standard on them. The Tesla chargers there can charge other cars and the Teslas. And that will probably come here. I always say it'll come here when either A, the government mandates it, which I don't think will happen because we're pretty laissez-faire here, or when it's an advantage for Elon Musk to take advantage of all the other charging infrastructure that's out there, then you'll do it, you know, so um, that's when that will happen. So here's an example of the fast charging stations for our region. I just did this uh, screen cut the other day, so this is pretty current. It's getting better, right? You know, you can look around and you can say, well, yeah, you know, I can see how you could drive your monkey. Some of those with the wrenches on them are ones that we're building. Uh, the one at Schwamigan National Forest is ours. Uh, there's one at Holman, Wisconsin that we've yet to commission at the brand new Quick Trip there. And uh, so we're, we're getting some out there. Uh, the western, western northern part of Wisconsin, northwestern part of Wisconsin is uh, primarily infrastructure that we built, fast chargers that Darylin built because we weren't seeing it develop fast enough. It's another slide here. Uh, okay. That's the, uh, these are the Tesla charging stations and you can see the gray ones are under construction. So Tesla is still building out a ton of charging infrastructure as well. Uh, they need to because they sell more cars than all the other car companies combined as far as electric vehicles. So 
um, they are putting a lot of the electric vehicles on the road. And since those uh, Tesla charging stations are the ones that service Teslas, they've been building a lot of charging infrastructure. So again, if they open that up, it'll be a lot broader access for everyone. And then there's Maimaki, that's the Holman charging station. So this is a little bit about what we're doing. This is a 180 kW charger. Maimaki can charge at 150 kW. That's how fast it can accept electrons from the charger. It means that in about 20 minutes, I can go from zero to full if it's accepting at that high rate. Now, cold weather, the batteries are cold. They don't want to take it that fast. And so I don't get that fast of a charge. But um, in general, in the summertime and stuff, it's a really quick stop. Usually, by the time I go into the business, I've stopped at, grab a cup of coffee, use the restroom and come back out. I look and I'm like, hey, I got enough miles to get home. I go on home and I charge when I get home. So I'm not worried about getting home with a full tank like I'm with a gas vehicle. So what is the very low charge so you can fill up your car with electricity? Yeah, so that's um, actually operated by Riverland because Dairyland, again, is a wholesale provider. We're not in the, um, the uh, retail business. So Riverland Energy operates it. Uh, the charge on that one is $2 to connect and then 28 cents a kilowatt hour. So it would cost about $14 to fill up my car, $14 to $16. Uh, and that would give me another 200 miles of range by doing that. So it's, it's still cheaper than gas, even with the fast charger, but I always only take on as much as I need to get home because when I get home, I'm charging for less than half of that cost, yeah, right? So um, it's much cheaper to charge at home. That's another total paradigm shift that people don't often think about with the electric vehicles, 90 some percent of my charging is done at home. I just don't stop that often at a fast charger, only if I have to when I'm traveling. If I could make the round trip and I get home almost empty, best deal in the world because I'm going to put cheap electrons back in the car. Is that the typical sized car? Um, those are becoming more typical. So, this is um, the Tesla Model Y was the first one sort of in this size class, kind of a, a crossover four door. Seats four people comfortably can technically seat five, but really four people and a child maybe. <laughs> has a nice size trunk, has a decent size frunk, which is the front trunk, and because there's no engine there, so you might as well use the space for something. It's kind of fun to go to Walmart and open the front trunk and see <laughs> the groceries in there, and they're like, what happened to the engine? They forgot to put it in. So um, yeah, that's uh, it's a decent size car. The Volkswagen ID4, very similar. In fact, there's a half a dozen cars that are very similar. It's Jaguar I-Pace. Uh, the Cadillac uh, Lyric is coming. It's a little bigger than this. Uh, also a little more expensive because it's a Cadillac. But, yeah. I was uh, curious, in the summertime, are you able to utilize the full charge into a vehicle? Yeah. Yeah, so when it's hot, that's not near so bothersome as cold. So it has fans and a liquid cooling system on the battery. So during hot days, uh, you can't see the front of the car, but there's louvers on the front. It doesn't really have a radiator grill or anything, um, but there's louvers on the front that open up and there's fans that run. And so if I hook up to a charger on a really hot day, you'll hear that roar of the fans running and stuff uh, to keep the batteries cool while it's charging. That's much easier to do than warming the batteries in the wintertime to try to take a fast charge. So usually in the summer, I get a fast charge. I've seen some videos where they go to fast chargers online isn't able to utilize the full capacity of fast charge. Sure. Say, yeah, yeah, and and, and it varies by car, right? So the Mach-E can charge at 150 kW. That new Hummer, which we'll see a little later, can charge at over 200 kW. The Rivian can charge over 200 kW. It's a combination of the two. The charger has to be fast. So the one we have at uh, Holman can deliver 180 kW. Most of the ones we put in the more rural areas only can deliver 50 kW. The Chevy Bolt, the Nissan Leaf can only accept 50 kW. So you can plug them into a 180 kW charger, but they're only going to take 50 because that's all the faster that infrastructure inside the car can take it at. So, yeah, it's kind of a combination of both. Are you advancing slides for me? Yeah, I have a oh, yeah. question from online. Um, is or did Tesla paying for all of the chargers, or is Tesla paying for all the chargers that exist and being built for Tesla? Was there any government funding to assist Tesla with charging stations? So yes, Tesla has paid for all of their own charging infrastructure. Was there any government assistance is kind of, um, yeah, maybe sort of, kind of, right? Because Tesla had loans early on. They repaid their loans very early too, but they did have government loans early on. So 
can you say there was no government funding in it? Probably no. Is there now no government funding in it? Yes, there is now no government funding in it. Tesla now has, I don't know what the current today market value is, but a, a few weeks ago or whatever, their market value was equivalent to like the three largest car companies in the world. So the Tesla market value was equal to Ford, GM, and somebody else, you know, and so it's their market value is massive now, it gives them borrowing powers. They don't need the government anymore. So I hope that answers the question. These are a couple of fast chargers. <clears throat> These are both 50 kW. They're at the new Sleepy Hollow Ford dealership. Uh, they have the Charge brand on them. That's a brand that our cooperatives uh, sort of created to get a unified look and, and branding for the chargers that electric cooperatives are putting in the rural areas. This will be open in another month. Uh, and so it's open for anyone to charge at, but obviously it's also they're selling cars too at the same time. So uh, that's where my Ford mach -E came from. No, no uh, insider trading there or anything. It just happened that the cooperatives decided to work with him and put in uh, fast charging there. So it's operated by the cooperatives, but hosted by Sleepy Hollow Ford and Rural Club. So again, a little charging in the rural areas, it's a good thing. This is another thing that Darren's been doing is funding um, level two chargers at destinations. So often when I travel, one of the things I'm looking for at a hotel is an electric vehicle charger, because it'd be great if I could just show up at my hotel and plug in, I'll pay, I don't care. If it costs extra, that's fine, but it would be so great to just plug in and have a charge the next morning. I can find that sometimes, but not very often. And so we've been working to build out more of that. This one uh, is actually in Eau Claire and the chargers are made that, the shell of the charger anyway is made in Wausau, Wisconsin. The core of the charger, uh, the charger itself is made in California. The smart board in the charger is made in Minnesota. So it's all made in USA, but yeah, go ahead. What's that about level two? So level two, okay. We, we didn't really talk about that. Sometimes I go through the, the basics, and sometimes I skip over. So the, the level one charge would be plugging into 120 volt receptacle and plugging your car in. That's a pretty slow way to charge. You can get four to five miles of range per hour of charging. If you have a plug-in hybrid and you know you've got a gas engine there and you've only got 40 miles of range, level one, just a regular receptacle in your garage, probably good enough to, over, to charge overnight, right? Because you only need to put 40 miles back to that eight hours. No problem, you can do it. Level two is 240 volts, uh, starting at about 30 amps and going on up from there to about 80 amps, I think is the top end. Um, and that can put a lot more charge in a lot faster. So a level two charger, the basic one can put in uh, 20 miles of range per hour of charging. And the fastest level two chargers can put in about 40 miles of range per hour of charging. So that charger that you see there, if I plug my car in there and I need a 200 mile charge and it can put in 20 miles of range per hour of charging, I can get that overnight. You know, 10 hours without me there, whatever, I'll make a full charge the next day. Level three is the fast chargers that we've been talking about. And level three starts about at that 50 kW level, which gives you 150 miles of range in an hour of charging, it goes on up to 350 kW, which would give you theoretically a thousand miles in an hour of charging, but more realistically, in 15 minutes, you can get a full charge in a car at 350 kW. Right now, there's only one car that can take over 300 kW, it's the Porsche Taycan. So it's set up to take that super fast charge. And there are some of those chargers around. There's uh, 350 kW, there's a pair of them at Toma, and there's a pair at Eau Claire, uh, Woodbury, Minnesota, then Madison, Wisconsin. So there's some of them along the, the major interstates. So yeah, one of the things researching this is like, yeah, the cost of putting in the truck. So you've got the cost <laughs> of putting up the vehicle, but then you have to really probably get this level two charger in yeah. your red. So if you're gonna drive a pure electric car, right. yeah, a level two charger is pretty much a requirement, right? It depends on how your garage is wired, right? Right. If your garage has 240 volts in it already, it might not be that expensive. I mean, we I'm on a fourth one. We, we've tested some different ones in my garage. I have a 75 year old garage, but somebody had probably had a welder there or something that owned the house before me. So we had 60 amps, 240 volts, it was no problem. I could put in chargers there. In fact, I've got another charger in the little garage that's fed off of that. So um, can vary. You know, if you have to run it from the opposite end of the house, 
the power comes in on the opposite end of the house, you got to run all the way across and it's a heavy circuit and so forth. It could be $1,500 just to get the power over to your garage. And then the charger's somewhere around 400 bucks. Okay. Now my Mach E did come with a charger that's 240 volts. It's actually both. So it has a heavy plug on it that's for 240 volts and it has a little plug on it that can plug into 120 volts. I've never had it out of the trunk. It's there for if I need a charge sometime and I can't find a charger, it's the same plug that's on a welder, uh, electric range, or an RV plug in an RV park. So it's that same plug. So I always figure that's my fallback, right? If I get stranded somewhere, I at least got something I can plug in and charge. Next slide. So finding a fast charger is too much work. The Tesla cars will find them for you and route them. Uh, my Mach E will find uh, the chargers for me if they're in the system. The other day, I drove up to Trigo, Wisconsin, where we have a fast charger located. It's not on the Ford map. So by the time I got there, my car was crying that I was too far away from a charger. And I better stop and find the charger because I was going to run out of battery. And I had no, no way to get home. You know? uh, and I'm like, you don't know. There's a charger where we're going. So, uh, so uh, plugged in when I got there, got lunch, did the things I had to do, and by the time I left, I had a charge and was able to get back to Eau Claire, where I stopped and took on just a little more charge. By the time I was in and out of Sam's Club or uh, Walmart, there I was ready to go, and uh, because that charge was much faster at, at uh, Sam's there in Eau Claire. Next slide. So um, charging takes forever. I think we've kind of been through that, just how fast charging goes. So you go to the next slide. Uh, you know, you don't need a sleeping bag. Here's the levels. There's that level one, two, and three thing. Uh, so this is just the level three. So this is splitting down the fast charging into the fast and the super fast and the ultra fast. Uh, there aren't really any categories to define those. There's not four, five, and six, but uh, yeah. You don't need a sleeping bag. You can do most of your charging at home, as I talked about. Go ahead. We got a lot of slides here, so I'll be maybe uh, asking for your patience by the time we get done. Um, not better for the environment. So we, we do hear this sometimes. It takes more energy to manufacture an electric vehicle. It's not wrong. It does. It takes more energy to manufacture an electric vehicle, to manufacture the batteries and so on and so forth. There's also mining extraction issues with uh, the, the batteries and the components that they use, the particular minerals that they use. It's not unique to electric batteries, so you can go on to the next slide if you want. Uh, they do pay back those increased emissions from the manufacturing uh, in a period of about two years, typically. That's getting better and better because the car manufacturers have figured this out and they're moving to try to use greener and greener manufacturing methods and materials. So if they use low carbon methods to manufacture the car, then that starts to close. As far as the materials that are in them, you know, cobalt is the one that gets called out a lot. And that's true, cobalt's mined under some really terrible conditions. And uh, there is a big effort to get rid of the cobalt that's needed in the batteries. One of the, uh, the two Tesla entry level models, the Model Y and the Model 3, the entry level was now used LFP batteries, which have zero cobalt in them. So there is a move to get away from that, and it is working. Uh, the other thing I always point out is nobody blinks when they use carbide tools, and that's what makes carbide tools hard is cobalt. And as far as precious materials, people are stealing catalytic converters off of gasoline cars because there's palladium and uh, platinum in them. So there's precious rarities in those too. So yeah, we're working on it, but uh, they are cleaner. The electric grid is getting cleaner and cleaner all the time. So unlike a gas vehicle, which because of wear and tear gets dirtier and dirtier as you drive it, your electric vehicle gets cleaner and cleaner because the grid's getting cleaner, the energy you're putting in it is getting cleaner. And so therefore the car will be cleaner five years from now than it was because there's less coal plants making the electricity that goes into it. So you're frowning, you're not buying that. So. All right, okay. You think about it a little while, we'll talk about it. All right. So um, yeah, can you run them with solar? So I get this a lot. And there's a car company that's trying to make a super efficient, super lightweight car that can actually run on solar if you leave it out in sunshine all the time. A couple of things that are wrong with that, we park our cars in garages almost all the time. So there's not a lot of sunshine falling on it. But even this one, which is an electric vehicle used on safaris in Africa, where the sun shines all the time, um, you can get 20 miles of range per 10 hours of sunshine. So there's just not enough area to put a lot of solar on top of the car. Um, you can do some things that uh, older Priuses 
um, there was a time when they had a solar panel on top. And what it did was run a ventilation fan to keep the car cooler. And that's why my Maki is white, to try to keep it cooler. And then I got it, and the roof is all glass. And I'm like, whoa, so much for the color. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. So is it possible to use solar panels on buildings that are already existing or something? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So you can, you can it, it is absolutely a thing. You can use solar panels to power the charger, especially at home. Right, because again, we're going at this lower charge rate stuff. If we tried to put up enough solar powers or solar panels to power the charger at Quick Trip, we'd have to cover the whole lot in solar panels. The real estate is too expensive. The driving around the barriers and so forth with the, the canopy, you know, the things that hold up the canopy, especially here in our winter regions where we get a fair amount of snow. So you have to build the canopies a lot heavier than you do in, say, Arizona. Where you can put a solar canopy up that keeps the car cool and it also um, collects a lot of sunshine because the sun shines more often and you never have to worry about the snow load breaking down the, the thing so certain climates yes um, and certainly we can designate energy from renewable sources to our chargers some of the chargers i've showed you they have done that so the cooperative says we want to buy renewable energy to go to that charger People say, well, okay, is that like a sin tax? Are we really, really doing something different by buying the renewable energy? And the answer is yes, because if you buy that renewable energy and designate that for the charger, it means that the next time Dairyland or XL Energy or whoever has to meet their uh, renewable performance standards, where they uh, portfolio standards, they have to have a certain amount of renewable energy. They can't use the energy that you bought, so they have to build new. So it does eventually cause the building of new uh, renewable energy if you power your car with renewable energy. So, next slide. Battery recycling, uh, there's this big myth that you gotta landfill all the batteries and so forth. The truth is that the materials and the batteries are so valuable that they can definitely be recycled. Now uh, you can go to the next slide. There's a company called Lifecycle that's a Canadian company <clears throat> and they're building, uh, they actually bought the Eastman Kodak campus and they're building a big recycling effort uh, there and also in Arizona. Another one is called, uh, I think it's called Redwood Materials. I don't know if I have it up there or not. Uh, Redwood Materials is um, a former Tesla employee who did a lot of the early design of the Tesla cars and so forth. Uh, pretty much a genius. J.B. Straubel is his name. Graduated from UW-Madison. And uh, don't count him out. He is a really, really bright person. And he's saying that He's going to recycle these batteries better than the other guys and so on and so forth. The life cycle people are saying they're going to do it with zero wastewater and zero emissions. So it should be clean and uh, not contribute to. And also uh, this whole, whole idea is to get a full circle thing to where, you know, it's a sustainable thing where you're just basically recycling the batteries. They've shown that some of the recycled batteries can have better performance than the ones made from uh, virgin materials. Why? I don't know. Yeah, 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 go for it. So uh, myth that the vehicles, uh, electric vehicles are a fire hazard. Somewhat true, right? Because if you get them on fire, they're very difficult to put out. <laughs> the, the batteries themselves can start a self-sustaining fire if they go into thermal uh, runaway and are on fire. So, um, you know, I always have to admit that, right? Because there's a ship burning somewhere right now that has a whole bunch of electric vehicles on it. When it got on fire, we don't know if it started because of the electric vehicles or not, but once it got the electric vehicles on fire, that became a whole lot more problematic fire than it would have been if they hadn't been there because they began to do this self-sustaining thing when they burn. So, so it's true, they can burn, right? But here's the insurance uh, uh, comparison. So hybrid cars per 100,000 cars, 3,475, let's just say, because there's not a half a car that burned. Um, and then gas cars, 1,530 cars, and the electric cars, 25 cars per 100,000. So pretty rare. This is, this is you know, per 100,000. So we're putting them on a similar comparison. Recognize that there aren't that many electric cars out there, but if you put it on basis of 100,000 cars for every 100,000 cars, pretty rare to get an electric car on fire. Go ahead. Go ahead. Why is, I don't understand if it's the batteries that are all the so it's a good question. I, so I, I have no idea why. These are the facts, right? I, I don't know why. 
so maybe the fact that you have the gas and the electricity, maybe the gas starts the fire, the components all being packed in. So building a hybrid car, a plug-in hybrid car, sounds easy enough. Oh yeah, we've done it for years with the Priuses and so on and so forth. But when you start to think about it, you have all the components of a gasoline car, all the components of an electric car, all crammed into the space of one car. It is a supreme challenge that they have done to build that all that way. So maybe that's the reason the denser you pack things, the quicker they are to catch on fire. The phones that came, I can't remember which Samsung phone it was that was catching on fire. It was because they crammed a lot of battery into a little bitty space, you know, and they, oh, maybe we shouldn't have made it quite so small, right? You know, uh, that was cool to make it there really that small, but it didn't, didn't uh, hold up so well. So, technology is probably getting a lot better too with batteries. Yeah, it's, um, and, and another thing is these batteries that are in most of the EVs right now are flammable, but some of them aren't. Again, the Tesla Model Y and, and uh, three, the entry level ones use the lithium iron phosphate batteries. It's very hard to catch those on fire. And when you do, you can't keep them burning. Very different from the other, the, the nickel, nickel magnesium cobalt that are in the rest of the cars. So. So uh, we talked about the uh, glorified golf carts and uh, GM put that to rest once and for all when they started building the Hummer. This uh, truck has a thousand horsepower, something over 11,000 pound feet of torque um, and is just a behemoth. I think it weighs 9,000 pounds. So it's kind of interesting and it's interesting that the Hummer brand came back. They tried to sell the Hummer brand way back in the day and the Chinese were this close to buying it and then the deal fell through. And so GM still have the Hummer brand and they'll we'll build an electric car. And this will put to rest the idea that electric cars can only be small little bitty vehicles that don't have any power. Zero to 60 on this is like three seconds, which is crazy for a 9,000 pound vehicle. Is that like, that's probably like 120. 112,000. 112,000, 112, yeah. So you'd think nobody's gonna buy one of these, right? I was up at a dealer in Northern Wisconsin. It's a relatively small town. I can't even think of the name of it. He had sold three. In their dealer network, which did extend into the cities, they've sold over 100, resold 100 of these things. So there are people out there with lots of bucks that are going to buy these cars, I guess. How am I on time? Are we over or? You're, you're, you're good? good. Okay, we're good. We'll keep going because we've got the foot. From here, it goes fast. It's fun. This is the Model Y. We've talked about this a lot. Um, you know, if you don't like the Y, you can try the S or the 3 or the X. Now, that 3 would have been an E, but. Um, Ford said we already had the trademark to the E, so then you can see you can see what it would have spelled. No, they weren't trying to avoid it. He was trying to spell it, and, and you put the Y at the end, it would have been sexy. Right? So, that's Elon Musk for you. He's a character, right? So, all right, go on to the next one. So this is the Maki. You can see what the front end looks like now. I can't use the uh, laser pointer because it won't work on those over there. I think my batteries are dead anyway. But. Um, down to the louvers there. They're actually open just below, between where the license plate would be, yeah, to the right and left of the license plate. Those are the louvers. The louvers are actually open. Most times they're closed and they look just like the center part, but that's that's what opens up when you're charging at the high rate of speed. Somebody was asking about that. So those open up and there's a fan that the ones that makes kind of a roar while it's charging. Now, up to 300 mile range, if you get the uh, two wheel drive version, I've got the all wheel drive version and that shortens the range a little bit. Starts. Okay. What's the horsepower on that? Um, 350 horse in the in the version that I have. I think it's a little less in the single motor one. And this one will do zero to 60 in about four and a half seconds in the all wheel drive. There's a GT version that can get you down to that three and a half seconds if you really need to get there faster. Charge. <laughs> <laughs> it is too fast of a car. I have to be careful driving it because it's it, speed. It, the it, torque is how fast, you how fast you can get. Yeah. So the torque is what's growing. Yes, yes. Yeah. right. The breaking up, which my wife does not want. <laughs> Don't do that. Don't step on it. And this is uh, also set up for one pedal driving. Most of them are. And what that means is when you take your foot off the pedal, the car slows down and will come to a stop. And so you rarely have to use the brakes. I do use the brakes occasionally to clean the rust off of them because the rotors do actually rust because they're used that little. I hardly ever have to use the brakes. Um, so it drives, I say it drives like a hydrostatic tractor, except a lot faster. Uh, the one thing you have to learn is you don't just lift your foot off because if you lift your foot off, it will stop very quickly. But if you just feather it back and forth and your foot's always on the accelerator, then you can drive without it hurting. 
And once you get used to that, it's like every car should be like this. This is silly. So next, next slide. Uh, Volkswagen ID4, another Model Y competitor, uh, very similar to the Mach E, a little bit less price, a little bit less range. Um, I think the dealer in town, the last time I talked to him, which was almost a year ago, had 13 of these on order. They're very hard to get. Um, so uh, there's supply is starting to come off, but they will be built in the U.S. eventually. Apparently, they will in Germany. Next slide. Nissan Aria, maybe you saw this one in the Super Bowl commercials. You might have seen several of these. Yeah, it was the, what's the crazy guy that was in the, the American Pie guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So mostly he's driving a little Nissan sports car, but they're advertising this car. It appears like twice in the advertisement. And I'm like, okay, so how am I supposed to get out of that that I should go buy this car when he's zipping around in this little yellow car? <laughs> But anyway, um, that's modern advertising for you. So, okay, there you go. So um, similar range, similar pricing, available early 2022. We didn't really talk about the different connectors. We talked a little bit about Tesla having a different connector. Nissan also used a different connector. This one does not. This one will come with the CCS connector. So we're seeing the standard move towards one connector for the fast chargers. It's not an issue for you if you have an older Nissan because every charger we put in has both connectors on it. We have the Chatham connector and we have the CCS connector. So the fast chargers that you find will have both connectors for the next 10 years or so, and then we'll start building that only have this connector. Next slide. And so this is the Kia EV6, the one with the puppy and the Super Bowl ad. Everybody wants the puppy. They could care less about the car. They want the robot puppy. Um, but it's a really great car. Another one that's very similar pricing. Uh, capacity, range, and the whole thing to the Tesla Model Y. This is the, the sweet spot to get in the market according to what they're trying to do. Notice that most of them, the door handles are recessed. That's just the new thing too. You kind of tap on the door handle, but Tesla started that and everybody else decided they had to go. Next slide. Rivian R1T, this is a truck built in Illinois. Um, they're just starting to trickle onto the marketplace. If you don't have one reserved, you won't get one for the next two years. Um, Again, super fast, super high powered. Um, this is a little bit smaller. This is more like um, in between sort of what a Ranger and an F-150 would be. It's kind of like, uh, remember how the Dakota used to be a little bigger than the others? This one's a little bigger than the others. And now that all the other ones are as big as the Dakota was. Yeah. So um, yeah, available now if you pre-ordered 67,500 um, all wheel drive. So there's four motors in this one. So it can do crazy things like a tank turn where it can just basically spin around in place. Uh, and uh, there's, you can get a kitchenette that goes in it because it's it's the adventure vehicle. So it's meant for camping and stuff. So there's a gear tunnel in behind the door of the, the passenger door on the back. And you can slide that gear tunnel out on the one of the kitchenette, which is an extra six grand, I think. And then it has a little kitchen set. It has an infected burner and stuff. And you can just do your cooking while you're camping and stuff. So. I don't know if you can sleep in the bed of it or not properly. So next slide. Uh, this is the Tesla Cybertruck. Um, probably not going to start at $30,000, $39,000. It'll be higher than that probably. Uh, range up to 500 miles available someday because they keep delaying it. It was supposed to be available now, but they keep pushing it out, pushing it out. But they are building a lot of factory. So there's a huge factory going up in Texas that's supposed to build these after they get done meeting the, the demand for the Model Y. Is it stealth or something? Um, yeah, so, so yeah, so, so this is again, Elon being Elon, right? And it's, it's, it's got all kinds of funky things. So it's made out of stainless steel. Uh, that stainless steel is theoretically bulletproof. The glass was supposed to be bulletproof. And when they sort of demoed it, they had Hans, which is one of the engineers, pick up this big steel wall and throw it at the glass. And he hits it and it shatters. <laughs> and he's like, well, okay, that was a fail. And so Hans says to Elon, should I try the back one? And stupidly, Elon says yes. And he slams it and breaks that one too. So that was a fail. But, but uh, so that's what most times when you find pictures of this truck, it shows the two shattered windows because that's the iconic thing about this truck. And I'm sure they've resolved that or whatever. But yeah, there's all kinds of. The reason it's kind of got the pyramidal shape is it's unibody. So it's not a body on frame like every other pickup truck in the world, but except the little bitty ones. So they need that long tapered triangle in the back to get the rear end frame. 
And this is supposed to have crazy capabilities too, zero to 60 in three seconds, towing up to 13,000 pounds, I think on this one. And, uh, you know, it's got a front trunk in it and so on and so forth. So yeah, it's an acquired taste, the design, but yeah. <laughs> Next slide. F-150 Lightning, if you want something that looks more like your regular truck, this is the one, right? It's uh, very much like the regular truck. The light bar goes across the top, but for that, you probably couldn't hardly tell the difference. Uh, there'll only be a few of these available in 2022. The demand completely outstripped what Ford was thinking would happen. <laughs> so they have a waiting list of like 100,000 people. Um, so there's uh, a, a ton of people that are interested in this. And you think about how some people use a truck, myself included, my F-150 rarely leaves the county. And when it does, it's not a really long trip. You know, I might drive it 150 miles or something, but it's mainly used for around town kind of things, hauling things and towing the horse trailer and so on and so forth. Horses don't move very far. So, you know, um, you could get by with a truck that has 300 miles of range. It would be no problem. When it's towing, it probably cuts it to 150 right now. Same as my gasoline engine, right? When I put a trailer behind the truck, it cuts my gas mileage right in half. And so same kind of thing. So you'd need to find a charging station. One problem with that is so far, we haven't hardly built any charging stations that are drive through parking spots. They're all pull in. I don't want to pull in with the trailer and then back out of the charging spot. So we've been talking with Quick Trip about that. You know, the next generation of these have to be just like your diesel bays and your gas bays where we can drive up, charge beside and drive away, you know, where we don't have to back up the trailer. So there's some changes that need to happen. Next slide. This is the Chevy Silverado uh, electric. Don't have a price yet, but there might be some in 2023. I really like the look of this one. Uh, I'm a Ford guy through and through, driven a Ford truck for the past 30 years, but I really like the way this one looks. So. Uh, yeah, I have to switch. I don't know. I, I think, Jeff, we are just about out of time. So if you have any closing comments, um, and then uh, we'll go from there. Yeah, we're, we're pretty much there. So the, the trucks are kind of the end of it. This is uh, what we think for our rural areas is really going to change things. Um, because uh, in rural Wisconsin and rural Minnesota, what do you drive? If you got anything, you've got a truck, right? You know, because you have to have a truck for your job or whatever. Yeah, this is the BWID buzz. My wife really likes that. It's coming in 2023. 20, and yes, she would want that color. Yeah. Her Jeep is that color. Her Volkswagen Beetle before that was that color. So yeah, they are easy to find in the parking lot. But yeah, we'll end on this one. There's some more about big trucks and motorcycles and so forth, but we'll end on this one. Well, Bill has been providing a uh, constant information about different cars than what you have listed the number one most expensive is the ass park owl at 3.6 million oh yes so that would be a supercar probably zero to 60 in two seconds right? <laughs> and a top speed of over 200 miles an hour right so that's for people who really need to get somewhere in a hurry <laughs> get away cars yeah Yeah, so, so yeah, the, the question is infrastructure needs and so on and so forth. The, the nice thing is we'll probably have 40 years to get there because we replace about 5% of the fleet per year. If there were 100% electric cars available, that would be to take 20 years to replace the entire fleet. We're nowhere near 100% electric cars being sold right now. So my guess would be 40 years. Um, a lot of charging will happen at home. But not everybody has a home that's like got a garage with it, so on and so forth. People live in apartments, people live in condos, people live in things that don't necessarily have a garage. And so there'll be a need to provide some sort of charging infrastructure either on the street or somewhere. As far as does the grid have the capacity to do it for the foreseeable future, for sure, no problem. We do have to build in local uh, uh, upgrades to serve these fast chargers. So for example, at Quick Trip and Pullman, there's an extra transformer there that's just for the fast charger. The fast charger runs at 480 volts. The store runs at 12208. So we need a special transformer to do that. So there's some local infrastructure required, but did we need more primary conductor? No, it's fine. We've got plenty of capacity to do that. And at home, if we can put you into the nighttime hours to charge your car, it's a win-win because there's more renewable energy available at night 
and there's less load at night. So if we can soak up the renewable energy that's available at night, it just means that again, our grid gets greener because we have electric cars, we're able to use more of an energy. Sure. Eventually, we'll probably have two-way power. I mean, Ford and Kia have been talking about it a little bit. Theirs are a little different, but uh, the next generation of the charging cords of capability will be that you can deliver power back from the home to the grid. So if your car's at home and plugged in, and you've agreed to the special deal we have for you, oh, yeah. right? We can take some of your battery and support the grid during those really hot days when the air conditioning load is high and we need an extra boost. We can pull battery out of the pull charge out of the battery. So again, that'd be an agreement that you'd you'd work out with us and probably get your electricity for the car for half price to do that. Yeah, they used to be on the water heaters that right now. Yeah, yeah, we do load control. We still do load control on the water heaters. We just shut them off. This is a little different because we can actually pull power back a little bit. Yeah. And do I have enough battery in my mach to do that? Most days I drive it 30, 40 miles. It's got 200 miles of range. I could give you a lot of capacity. I could give you six hours of capacity. The power company is actually build a storage uh, facility for electric cars. So it would just be distributed amongst the homes and stuff. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Distributed storage instead of building a big battery bank, which we do today. We haven't done it there yet, but utilities are building big battery banks in, in uh, lots of places. And, you know, as an alternative to doing that, if the batteries already exist, they're in the car, you can monetize it by getting a lower rate to charge your car. How sweet is that? <coughs> so anyway, sorry I went over. No, you're, you're good, Jim. Right. So uh, if folks have additional questions, because we are a little bit over, if folks have additional questions, uh, please feel free to chat with Jeff after. But uh, Jeff, I just wanted to say thank you. I wish I could have been there. But I thought the presentation you did a couple of years ago for Valley View was fascinating. And the updates and you know pieces you shared tonight were were really cool. I mean, it, if if people didn't want an electric car before this, I don't know how they'd be, uh, they'd be opposed to it now. So uh, thank you for sharing your passion. It's clear how much you, uh, you know and you care about this topic. So we really appreciate you coming out on your evening to talk to us and speak with us and share your knowledge. And it sounds uh, from the interaction of the club, they've, uh, they've enjoyed uh, hearing about and um, asking you questions and understanding more. So again, Jeff, thank you so much for coming to visit us tonight and uh, have a wonderful evening and uh, know that you're always welcome if you ever want to come back and visit Rotary After Hours. All right, thank you. All right, so for uh, after hours, we'll close up here. So our next meeting is going to be part of membership week. So it's going to be vocationals and all the other events coming up on membership. And then after that, we'll have rotary lights. So I believe the last thing we'll do tonight is the four way test. And then Lisa has been very excited to ring the bell. So we'll get to that. Uh, or the five way test. Is it the truth? Is it fair to all concerns? Will be beneficial. Be beneficial. All and Lisa, thank you so much. And thank you everybody for coming tonight. Hopefully, you all learned some good stuff. And uh, you know, again, thanks, Jeff, for presenting and uh have fun. And we'll see y'all again in a couple of weeks. All right. See y'all. Tonight's the last time we're ever gonna see Laksha again. <laughs> Uh, so we're going to go out to drinks at Bodega, which is about a block and a half over there. Hope to see you there. <laughs> that way. That way. Wherever, whichever.